Hello, hello, and welcome, everyone. We are here together for another great webinar. And as you know, and for the new uh, attendees, please type in the chat where are you joining us, uh, from where you join us today. We love to see how many places are on this together. So today we will uh, go for the webinar three about agroecology in the series Cultivating Living Soils. And the soft also talk about soil for the web, of course. And our star of the day is Ernest Gotch. So just to review the topics of today, again, is the series of cultivating living soils, the power of soil food webs in permaculture and beyond. This is a webinar three, symbiotic impact of agroecology and the soil food web. Uh, we are in the introductions, which will take about five minutes. Then we're gonna hear from Ernest Gotch which uh, unfortunately could not join us today. He's on a workshop teaching many more students, but he left a beautiful message for us. And then we're gonna talk with Philip and Joaquin about a blueprint to return uh, to the Garden of Eden and Q&A sessions uh, in a, uh, for about 30 minutes length. So today we'll be together for about one hour and a half. So without further ado, uh, remember that our guidelines is to keep this webinar an uh, enjoyable place for everyone. So keep yourself muted for the duration of the webinar to ensure good audio quality for all. Make sure that you're gonna use the Zoom Q&A session you can see at the bottom of your screen to enter your questions and also use the the chat to talk with uh, other attendees. And we have a lot of people uh, interacting with, including Dr. Elaine, Dr. Adam Cobb, and many other staff from the school that are here today. And also do not forget to have fun. Okay, so to re uh, revamp uh, this series of Cultivating Living Soils, we already had a beautiful webinar with Dr. Vandana and Dr. Lane, which I was honored to be the host. Thank you again. Then we had also a session with Mixed Species Orchard with a beautiful story with our uh, Joe Tobias and her clients, Kat and Ian Phelan. And today we have Ernest and Philip Burton joined with uh, Joaquin to talk about symbiotic impact of agroecology. And we, on this series, we have one more webinar coming on February 28th. Pay attention to the time, it will be 7 p.m. on London time or the same 11 a.m. in Pacific time zone. Do not forget to check the time zone. And if you are not on our uh, email list, please do so and also click on the YouTube link for a reminder so you're gonna receive the information for the next webinars. Okay, so let's introduce our panelists. Dr. Elaine. Um, I'm Dr. Elaine Ingham. Um, I'm founder and president of both the Soil Food Web Incorporated and the Soil Food Web School. So I get involved with projects all over the world um, and it's uh, just, it's growing so fast. It's amazing. Dr. Joaquin. Well, good evening to everybody. Uh, my name is Joachim Mills. I'm based currently in, in Germany, but I was living in Bolivia for a couple of dec decades, working together with Ernst Gerkirch and implementing uh, dynamic agroforestry or synthropic farming, uh, what, what is, how it's called now, in Bolivia and in other um, continents, uh, mostly West Africa, with uh, Ecotop Swiss and Ecotop Foundation. Thank you. Philip? Uh, hi, I'm Philip Barton, a Soil Food Web student, completing the Soil Food Web training program to become a Soil Food Web consultant. I'm an ag 
advocate and a practitioner of regenerative agriculture, spending the last four years traveling and working in different agroecological farms around the world. I founded Minds of Soil, which is a company that researches regenerative agriculture and gathers data to show how agriculture can be used as a tool to regenerate ecosystems. And um, through this work, my goal is to kind of redesign the role agriculture plays uh, to find solutions that heal both people and the planet. Thank you. Adam? Hi, Carla. Thanks for uh, <clears throat> introducing us here today. Um, I get to do um, content creation here at the school, sometimes that's writing a blog or um, being part of one of the um, guides that we're producing. In fact, I'm working on the vermicomposting guide right now with one of our amazing staff members, uh, Eric Feiler. And I get to work with Dr. Elaine and Dr. Portugal and Denise and other amazing staff here um, in my role as science communicator. And so um, I also get to interact with our students and the people who are, I like to call them pre-students, the people maybe in the room today who are thinking about purchasing one of our courses about technical questions and other things that that arise. So I am happy to be here and um, be part of this discussion today. Thank you. And I'm Carla Portugal. I'm honored to be the host today. Uh, normally, I'm located in Oregon, but today I have the pleasure to be talking from Brazil. So, oi a todos in Brazil. É bom estar aqui na mesma time zone. <laughs> so let's hear from Ernest and Philip. Yeah, I'm a cocoa farmer since 45 years, first in Costa Rica, some years, and since 41 years in Brazil. And I uh, was working before uh, in plant improvement, which brought me, brought me to the conclusion that uh, perhaps it could be more um, efficient or intelligent to focus on the conditions we offer to our plants instead of trying to adapt themselves to the every year worse conditions we create or which are created which happen uh, due as a result of our way of interaction burning killing uh, chemical fertilizer toxic chemicals etc etc et yeah that's that and uh, I'm working all over the world, let's say in, in except Australia and all continents, and in all type of climates, let's say in from extreme dry places with uh, four extreme places, four millimeter, millimeters of precipitation per year uh, in the desert. And I'm working also in per humid forests uh, and then in cold climate, let's say it's probably our, uh, cold climates, all type of, of climates in order to test the principles uh, which I well set together is I try to to organize them in a, a small uh, figure called Tau for the comprehension of life. Ah, that's it. First, a small presentation of what uh, I'm doing. When I was working, as I said, in plant improvement. Uh, I came to the conclusion that it could be more intelligent to focus on uh, the conditions we offer to the soil. And so I began first with proper, which, what was uh, close by and uh, still happening partly, uh, looking at uh, and testing effect of uh, crop rotation, then consortiums, consortia of different crops, and tested them in the laboratory and then afterwards in the field. And that field work, I hired a piece of land in our, uh, one hectare close to the place I worked in Zurich and planted it with different uh, crops. And I came to the conclusion that it's not on the crop rotation and uh, consortiums of crops. It makes a lot of difference what you do, let's say, uh, using crop rotation. It makes more than sense. Uh, also, consortias make a lot of sense. Uh, I was impressed of consortias, old traditional consortias, for example, uh, maize and beans, it, uh, corn and beans, it gives it results in 30% uh, more corn, uh, additionally to the bean, and it's not only 30% more yield of uh, seeds, it's uh, uh, also 30% to 50 to 60% more growth, that's to say it's got the same variety of corn, 
uh, it grow instead of 220. Uh, it's high, it grow to three meters and uh, three meters and more, and it was completely dense. And then the soil in autumn time, together with the beans, it was transformed. We had about uh, two and a half to four centimeters of feces of uh, rain worm, of earthworms on the soil, which doesn't happen in a normal corn operation. And I broadcast then upon the corn before harvesting uh, wheat, it was in autumn time, I shredded about uh, 40 centimeters of the stalk of the, of the uh, corn and partly uh, also the, the, the whole material of the beans upon. And then the uh, yield of the uh, uh, wheat was so impressive as the corn, it gave about 80, uh, let's call it 48 percent more than normal, and it was completely different. It was strong. It didn't fall down. I planted it partly then too, together with uh, peas, which gave an excellent result. Well, uh, it's it was one of the of the tools, but I came to the conclusion that back coming back that is an ecosystem, uh, and so I began to try uh, work with ecosystem first in Europe, and uh, it was. For me, it was fascinating. Apples, uh, pears, whatever we had in fruits there, they did extremely well. And then planting uh, stripes of corn in between and planting uh, trees, fast growing trees uh, in between too. And so in the second, third years, when they were, became something uh, um, um, significant, the soil began to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, improve strongly and then i came to the tropics the first in costa rica and from there i went to brazil and in brazil i had to learn once again because i fall on i i fall i didn't i fell but i i acquired a piece of land which uh, had been uh, defined as, as not uh, recommendable to recommended to plant uh, cocoa and i planted since the first year uh, the same variety of corn I still plant nowadays, and it grew about seven to 10 centimeters tall. It didn't flower, it then died, and certain places it uh, faded away before growing. As you say, uh, it's, it uh, uh, just germinated and it died. And so beans, the same thing. 10 years later, uh, it was possible to harvest uh, after a strong or a heavy topping, uh, not cutting of the vegetation, but topping taking off or topping, uh, taking off about or pruning about 70 to 90 percent of the crowns of the trees, which cocoa trees supports and all other trees support it, and then shredded on the soil. And this gave them uh, impressive results, corn uh, producing marvelous uh, harvests, the same corn. And in the meantime, I often in wintertime, when I make the annual uh, popping of the plantations, topping, that is a cutting about 70 to 90 percent or cutting off about 70 90 percent of the uh, medium and higher layer shade trees upon the cocoa so there are often uh, some of open places i broadcast some corn and beans in those places and they grow and produce uh, in between and then i also tested uh, the same uh, principles in different places and with different different crops uh, so for example cotton which is something like world champion of uh, toxic chemicals uh, they use for it here in Brazil. They normally spray about uh, 30 to 35 fold uh, during one period of uh, cotton production and uh, use a huge amount of fertilizer to the base and uh, for, for that uh, culture. And we didn't use anything and it's only planting trees uh, in between and then cover uh, the soil with uh, shredded material, which resulted in 130% more, not 30%, 130% more uh, cotton and without need of any pesticides, no insecticides, no fungicides, no uh, any herbicides, no anything. They did marvelously. And I came to the conclusion that those so-called herbaceous uh, cotton, it should, it could, be a marvelous perennial and we should work with it as a perennial because in the second year we produced more and no attack of uh, diseases or no insects no fungi and so clearly uh, pests and disease they are not bad guys they are consequence of our 
mediocre or bad way of treating of interaction with the soil and we should focus on this item and then uh, I came uh, that's to say I have to say and this is for Elaine I came before I began that work I began to look at and study a little bit only a little bit of microbiology uh, and made a lot of uh, ex experiments in Zurich still in the research station in uh, yeah connected with this and so I'm extremely happy to uh, see beginning um, the future and cooperation between microbiology and uh, our way of or my way of doing agriculture uh, because I always say to people our friends on the other sides side they are very well organized and work together and we yeah uh, are some are acting something like artists uh, alone and often one against the other and so we should uh, if we would work together marvelous results we could achieve and uh, we saw this uh, with a small a uh, few samples philip took of our side uh, thank you Elaine, to teach people what i enjoy most is seeing the light comes on in their eyes and, and they finally understood why the toxic chemical approach doesn't work biology does work yeah i still hope that we uh, i will see that our approach i say now our approach as i say people who work together with plants with bacteria and fungi with life that this will become the main uh, stream agriculture in the world and in fact it's the only way to survive that's to say that we can survive life, life will uh, survive without us and <laughs> we cannot destroy it but uh, uh, we will uh, we are prone to disappear if we continue in a way as we are working in the last 150 years and we will dis would disappear too if we would continue working as we did it in the last 10,000 years Slash and burn, killing, and uh, working only with, uh, obviously, focus on annual crops. Yeah, uh, he, uh, we could perhaps look at some, uh, before I will stop, look at some slides, at some uh, pictures. Uh, this is of our neighbors. Uh, uh, begin with the, the uh, pictures of the place more or less as it was when I began. It, in fact, it still exists. It's a, a place which has the same history as ours. It was a, a pasture land for two decades for horses, let's say for uh, equinos, and then burned uh, three times in order to clean. But this is now our neighbor's place. This is uh, a place we took, Philip and I took some samples too. It's more or less representative. The, uh, one difference only, it is volcanic soil. And our place is not volcanic, it's uh, uh, yellow clay. And so it's uh, different, it's, uh, but the vegetation suffered the same uh, uh, bad treatment. And so it took a lot of time to recover a little bit. We have in the, front, in the left side, we still have uh, Imperata in left part. The picture has the left photo, we have, uh, right photos, we have still uh, Imperata cylindrica. And then in the uh, left photo, it's a small bush the landscape with some herbs underneath pH around four, for two, for three, and only traces of available phosphorus. And Philip took some uh, samples in order to look at microorganisms of the places. And when I began to plant that one, uh, that this is considered, and this place, that's to say, this type of vegetation is considered that it's not worthwhile to be cultivated because uh, no fertilizer. No irrigation, no uh, toxic chemical will help you a lot. Or you spend so much money so that it's, it will not pay for. Uh, then uh, I decided on to cut it only and use, in, uh, employ species which I knew or which I uh, yeah, knew by experience that they could grow that. That is a species of less privileged uh, type of uh, ecosystems, less privileged in terms of distribution quantity of precipitation and then available minerals and uh, planting on and less uh, privilege in terms of capacity of water retention 
and these functions, that's to say these functions uh, very well are used in extreme cases in bare soil situations used as pieces of uh, semi-dry and dry places, that's to say of uh, semi-desert species like agaves and uh, some uh, cactus, and they were substantial, and very, very important yet for the first moment always creating life, let's say planting and uh, optimizing a uh, life process photosynthesis and then uh, making a selective weeding, let's say cut uh, the species which had were flowering or prone them which were flowering or which has fulfilled their, their function and uh, concentrating a little bit in the surrounding of the nests of my plants and so after six years uh, the cocoa instead after four years it began to produce in 10 years. It was, as I said to you, it, it had been claimed that I uh, am privileged to have the best soil of the Cocoa region uh, of, uh, yeah, in, in uh, Bahia. So now the next photos uh, of maybe uh, of uh, uh, our place. Now this is our, of our neighbor's place, but it doesn't matter, I can explain it. You see the Cocoa tree, they have no shade and few organic matter on, on the soil, it's a uh, monostratus. Uh, with, uh, operation. They use uh, herbicides twice a year, so three times a year, and then uh, a lot of uh, lime every year, and uh, about 330 grams of NP uh, NPK, okay, and uh, six-fold uh, leaf uh, fertilizer in order to force them to produce, and they don't produce more than mines. Uh, quality, so about quality I will not discuss. And then on the left side, you see the plantation uh, in the same, at the same moment, at the same hour of the day, in the same day, uh, as we photographed, we made the photo out of our plantation. You see here the cocoa tree once again, and in the background, uh, I choose for that, uh, it's a forest, secondary forest, an old secondary forest, and so you see what should be. And uh, my uh, hypothesis is that we should create uh, agroecosystems similar in their way of functioning, in their dynamics and stratification to the natural and original ecosystems uh, in where, where we are uh, working on, let's say, where, which, uh, yeah, let's say, our places where we are working. Uh, this doesn't say that we have only uh, to plant uh, trees. We have the possibility to top the trees, to prune the trees. Nature does it too. And this gives marvelous results. Now photos of, uh, please show now photos of my plantation. This is my plantation. This is one photo of my plantation. As I said to you, it had been made at the same hour. And you see here, it's a stratified forest. You see on the top, on the, uh, on the top, the merchant tree, which I have normally spaced about uh, 20 to 30 meters one apart of the other. They are not submitted to annual topping. Uh, I only fell them uh, to thin them out since the beginning. That's yeah, since we are parent to thin them out. And then you see the medium layer composed of the next layer composed of palm trees and some fruit trees. And then the next layer, it's uh, topped trees. And underneath, uh, on the, the soil, let's see, you see only on the very right side, so you see the soil, the rest are cocoa trees. That's to say, it's one uh, on the cover of cocoa. It, they, in, in fact, they shade more percent in, in percent in percent of the soil than the neighbor's monoculture uh, cocoa trees. And this is now a half time, let's say half time, five to six months after topping. If you look, if, if we would look at the plantation uh, just before topping, then it's different. Then we will have a, a medium and higher layer not, uh, of 140% shaded. Uh, it's it's uh, at, at the end of harvest time and cocoa citrus is the same thing. Uh, mango is the same thing and apple is the same thing too. They need uh, sun might be for indi uh, induction for flowering. They need sun for flowering and they need uh, then shade and protection when they are ripening. Uh, this is for grapes, this is for uh, whatever I know of fruits. It, uh, it's photosynthesis of the plants, which def uh, uh, defines it, and uh, it's a reserve they have uh, in the soil. Let's say the quality of the fruits is much defined of the uh, PA, let's say of the uh, bricks. You have in bricks will be higher the more organic matter you have in transformation of the place, let's say, it's, it's, it's always a uh, process, uh, this, uh, and then it's the pH also of the leaves and the fruit, which will give you an, uh, an information of the quality, uh, and it all, it also its resistance of, yeah, resistance to so-called diseases and, and uh, um, pests. High pH, high uh, 
um, bricks uh, indicates that you have no problem with it. Okay, now our, our plantation, now the plantations are some uh, uh, small plant plantations experiments I made with uh, soya beans. And on the left side, you see a new cotton plantation. Uh, you see both sides, uh, a row of trees, and the trees are stratified. On the top, I planted for provocation uh, eucalyptus, blamed to be a bad guy who tries out soil and steals uh, for competition to other plants and has an allopathy, allopathy to other plants. And underneath, uh, it's not well clear, but if you uh, enlarge a little bit, you see the papaya. Then uh, next layer are local trees, which are coming up. And underneath, it's, it's quite dense, uh, it's coffee. Uh, coffee is not being submitted to the topping. Uh, local species, they, we topped the fastest growing ones bring them a little bit underneath the papaya uh, because we like to uh, uh, harvest the papaya and then the eucalyptus for the planting of the at the, moment, at the day of planting of the uh, introduction of this uh, cotton we topped and the organic matter shredded organic matter and broadcasted which is up about five centimeters of uh, organic matter and then you see the next uh, photo in the middle the same cotton uh, growing in the trees on the side and on the the right side, we see soya beans, and this also in the same context, trees on the side and the soybeans at the moment of harvesting, they were gigantic. Instead of, of uh, growing 50 centimeters high, they went to one meter and 20, the same variety, and produced a tremendous amount of, of uh, seeds. Uh, you can go the next photo, there is uh, soya beans alone, if you would, yeah. So we see the, the, the uh, uh, harvest of these soya beans, 80 to 90 uh, bags of 60 kilo per hectare. Uh, 60 is uh, considered to be a normal harvest in the tropics. That's a normal good harvest in the tropics. And so it's 50, 40 to 50 percent, or 30 to 40 percent more, and no pesticides, no insecticides, no uh, fungicides, and no uh, fertilizer we brought into uh, the place. Uh, uh, this uh, soybean operation uh, on this small notation, uh, I, uh, I'm enthusiastic about, but I see some uh, generally anomaly heavily criticized all over the world, a uh, Brazilian, not those ones, because they don't know what, uh, that they exist of a group of uh, Brazilian farmer who uh, plant soybeans without toxic chemicals they use. Uh, or they apply what they learned from Elaine. And uh, this has to be said, uh, and it should be published in the world because they don't harvest less than the other ones, and they made a huge step. Uh, then uh, one of the farmers, he passed, uh, together with a friend of his, also a soya farmer, he passed uh, on my farm uh, two, uh, two weeks. At the end of the two weeks, he said to me, Ernest, with Elaine, I came to the foothill of the Mount Everest with what you are doing and together with Elaine we will come to the top of the Mount Everest and all the rest of us in this room <laughs> and, all, and all the rest of us yeah <laughs> okay sorry uh, uh, yeah this is more or less as a presentation of of my uh, presentation of myself it's, a, it's really well done uh, this is a Tao uh, so I will not explain it here. You can read it. It's an agenda coach. Uh, it's a, a, a tried to uh, put together, uh, organized 15, uh, 15 principles uh, for the comprehension of life. It's a little bit different of what, of our comprehension. Let's say very much different. But uh, if you look at it, uh, it we are close to come uh, to it, seeing that our planet. Is one big macroorganism only, and life is one macroorganism on our planet, and uh, all and all species. That is to say, life on the planet, planet is part of, a, in, of the instrument planet Earth created for itself in order to realize its strategy of being, and so on. And then life only uh, also is based on ethics, and those ethics, they are also the same ethics we should follow <laughs> not different but i will not uh, go deeper in now and then the next small 
uh, our next uh, figure. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Philip. Uh, I had, I'm a software web student, uh, completing my consultant training course. And I had the privilege to work alongside Ernest and to see his cacao farm in Brazil. And I'll be talking through a presentation on our research that we found there with the Soil Food Web. Yeah, the research project was into the Soil Food Web present at Ernest's agroecological farm compared with three other locations that we tested that Ernest talked about. We had one conventional cacao farm, um, the original landscape that Ernest embarked upon 40 years ago. And we tested a secondary forest that had 70 years of uh, un yeah, unmanaged landscape. And our results were outstanding, but Ernest has achieved the ecological succession close to that of a climax ecosystem while meeting the needs of the present, matching the capacity of the most productive cacao farms worldwide, produces about 1,000 to 1,300 kilos of dry cacao per hectare per year. Um, and the answer to this question really does lie in our fungi from what we found. So for me, this, this picture that we have here encapsulates the, the presentation. Currently, we have 80% of all ecological damage is caused by our agriculture. We have 5.8 billion hectares of man-made desert and 70% of fresh water is used for our agriculture. So as a species, we're running out of time and space. And here we can see Ernest Cacao Farm that's integrated as part of the ecosystem and mim mimics nature. So it's restoring the hydrological cycle, um, cycling carbon back into the system, all while producing nutritious food. So for me, it's a beautiful image of what our agriculture could look like and what it should look like. Yeah, quick introduction to who I am. I began my journey in agroecology while traveling. Um, I was living with a good family that we were kind of living off the ocean and growing food next to the coast. And I realized that in an ecosystem that's in, that's in intact, humans can live quite a high quality of life just by involving themselves in the landscape. So I went to Costa Rica and became and did an apprenticeship um, in permaculture design, agroforestry, natural building and food and fermentation. Uh, I went on to create a farm to table business with my partner uh, called Casa Umami in the Osa Peninsula, focusing on regenerative agriculture and local food production, mainly fermentation. I uh, then moved to work on an organic farm and experienced cultivating crops for profit and saw the lack of confidence in the industry regarding my permaculture uh, insights. And so I decided to become a soil food web student so I could have the science to back up the regenerative practices that are, so, that are really beneficial for the world. Um, I founded Minds of Soil, which is my company to research regenerative agriculture and gather data to show how agriculture can be used to regenerate ecosystems while meeting the needs, needs of the present. I'm currently in uh, Soil Food Web training to be a consultant. Um, I had the opportunity to move to Brazil and work with Fernando Robuelo, uh, the founder of CIPAS, the Centro de Pesquisas in Agricultura Centropica, one of Ernest's students. And uh, we were working together on the Soil Food Web and the principles of centropic agriculture and combining them together. I had the privilege then to work with Ernest, uh, Fernando and Ernest's friend Enrique Souza to record the implication of their management strategies of this agroecological model um, and to look into the soil food web. And currently I'm completing my stage one and two in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, all right, next slide. Uh, Ernest was talking about the DAO and um, I just wanted to go a little bit more into that. This is one of Ernest's uh, quotes. In fact, the biggest share of external input I need to achieve high productivity, vigor of crops, and a steady enrichment of my cultivated area turns out to be knowledge. Um, the Tao is a path or a way, and it describes the complex relationship between humans and nature. And how I see that our disharmony in the world is, is due to that disbalance that we have. And it will lead to a cascading event of our times, which we see with David Montgomery's Dirt, The Erosion of Civilization, but we've never actually got it quite right. So we need to look at this problem and shift into a new paradigm and redesign our role in, in the ecosystem to flow in the Tao and turn our conscious interaction with disharmonious activities of agriculture into harmonious actions uh, that will serve both people and the planet. So which road should we take? After our separation from the Tao, we're looking for alternative solutions to align ourselves back to that natural flow. In our agriculture, we have such ideas as permaculture, agroforestry, uh, career natural farming, uh, bi biodynamic farming. But um, these are all great tools and they flourish in their own context. 
but we must use the knowledge that we are presented with from Ernest um, to align our actions with nature. And only by aligning our actions with nature and following her patterns can we design to the detail. And then these all of these tools become truly regenerative and we will restore our land to return back to the Garden of Eden. So the research project that myself and Ernest conducted at his farm um, was to examine if there was a significant difference between the soil food web. So we partnered together to measure the soil food web and compaction to examine if there are any significant differences between Ernest's agroecological land management strategies and the three other areas. We took Ernest cacao farm with 40 years sorry, about, of agroecological management, the neighboring conventional cacao farm, a 70 year old secondary forest and an undisturbed landscape, which represented the original landscape Ernest began with in terms of vegetation. Um, the soil testing was done using the soil food web approach because it provides us insight into the ecological succession um, of the land. It tells us what management practices it has received and it serves as a window into monitoring the ecosystem regeneration. So we're all familiar with this graph on the side that Elaine provided us with. And so we can, if we look at the function of these organisms, we can see where in succession we are. And if we're fostering an ecological succession, we're also gaining those, um, those benefits that we gain from being in that higher form of succession. So uh, next slide, please. Perfect. Um, the methodology that was carried out for, for the test is that the land was, was mapped um, to identify the homogeneous areas which were slated for assessment. But we define them as homogenous based in orientation and terrain, not necessarily species. So we all selected for, you know, the south facing, the north facing, the east and the west, and no concave shapes, um, no privilege was given to any areas. So these mapped areas were then divided into four sections. Uh, each of these four sections was then was then mapped and are represented to represent 40% of its total area. Um, a minimum of five sub reps were then taken in each area and accompanied by a compaction test using a penetrometer. So samples were taken both at 10 centimeters and 40 centimeters depth. Each sub rep underwent a soil food web assessment, resulting in the generation of a microbiological report. The soil food web assessments were then conducted within 72 hours of collection using a compound microscope uh, to ensure the viability of the organisms. This is a side note, this picture is the laboratory that I bought, <laughs> that I travel with, actually. Um, it's a little compound microscope. And we set this up at Ernest Farm so we could do all the tests on site, which was really, really fun. <laughs> a really fun thing to do. Um, and the results from all of the sub reps were then aggregated to determine the average soil food web composition and compaction of the whole area. And this was this process was replicated in the in all areas of interest. So because there were such large areas, um, we split them all up and then we got enough sub reps per area to represent those areas. And then we could generate a whole picture based on those um, on the data that we gathered. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we went through this with, with Ernest. Just again, these were the landscapes that we went through, the undisturbed landscape um, that Ernest began with uh, 40 years ago. And it, gave, it gives us that timeline to reference between what's actually changed due to Ernest management. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, here we have our 70 year, 70 year old secondary forest. This gives us a reference between natural uh, succession over time if we were to leave humans out of the system and not manage the landscape at all. So we have that kind of classic environmentalism approach where humans are separate and nature does its thing without us. And so this test was about how using Ernest's agroecological model, we could examine if he is actually fostering ecological succession faster than that of a natural ecosystem due to his interaction and his principles that he used. So kind of looking at us as a keystone species to redesign our role. Uh, the next, the next, the next slide, please. Uh, come back, coming back to the conventional cacao farm. Um, Ernest, if you can clarify this, I had they do use three hundred kilograms of fertilizer per hectare per year. That's correct. Correct. Yep. And six, and six fold still uh, liquid fertilizer on the on the leaves. Additionally. Okay. So that's, so that's the prescription from the agronomists in the area. And we can see that it's a classic monoculture farm with no overstory. As Ernest said, that there is this uh, secondary forest in the back, which is how this landscape should imitate. Uh, the cacao 
is a monoculture and genetically identi identical. So if one pest or disease issue comes through, if the whole crop does suffer from that, we can see that there's no resilience in this system because there is no diversity as well. So if there's one poor harvest, uh, the farmers really struggle to gain anything from this. Um, and next, the next slide, please. Uh, here we have Anis Agroecological Cacao Farm, the Fazenda, the Olios de Agua, the Eyes, eyes of Water, um, with 40 years of management focusing on his principles um, that he's uh, described. Uh, sorry, I just saw something funny in the chat there, um, where he focuses on the figure and uh, productivity and soil microbiology. He uses the tools, processes, and strategies devised by life itself, which are photosynthesis and complex systems. And the diversity of crops that we see in this picture buffers Ernest Farm against climate changes in terms of resilience. If, for instance, the diversity of the trees and timbers that he can use at his own will really make his farm a lot more resilient um, as we look into the future to, to design farms so that they are capable to withstand those climate extremes. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the results on the next slide. So here we have the data that I collected. Um, it was quite outstanding. To, to collect this data and to do these samples for Ernest. Um, on the left, we, this is that 10 centimeter soil samples that were collected, um, fungal to bacterial ratios. So we have a 16 to one at Ernest farm. Conventional cacao farm is at a 0.49 to one. We have a native forest which is at a four to one and the original landscape which is at a 1.4 to one. So on this table, we can see just how high Ernest fungal to bacterial ratio is. It's in the correct stage of succession for his crop. We can see that the lowest is found at the conventional cacao farm, which would indicate that their management practices um, have detrimentally affected those counts. Down here on the left side, we can see the fungal biomass per gram of soil, and Ernest sits at about 6,777 micrograms of fungi per gram of soil, which is close to that of a climax ecosystem that can take 500 to 1,000 years to, to achieve, and Ernest has achieved it in about 40 years. So. We need to pay attention to what, what he's doing uh, so we can start to implement this around, around the world. Um, here we have bacterial biomass counts. Um, we can see that the highest is at the conventional cacao. It's interesting when we look at this uh, graph and we also look at potential disease causing organisms. And with the potential disease causing organisms, when we cross-reference that with the fungal biomass, there's a, a very high number of potential disease causing organisms compared to our fungal biomass found in the conventional farm. The compaction is at the second highest reading here. So we can say that the management strategy that the conventional farm is, is using is solely proliferating bacterial biomass, causing these detrimental effects, and therefore we'll find more pests and diseases. Lastly, it's also interesting to see that the fungal to biomass ratio of the native forest is four times lower. So we have a four time fourfold difference in the fungal biomass achieved by Ernest compared to the native forest. So when we think about fungi and how much nutrients it can retain and foster in the system, um, Ernest is, is harnessing four times as much in his, at his farm. Um, the compaction readings were incredible. It was actually quite funny when I met Ernest, he saw me with my penetrometer and, um, asked me what it was, what I was using it for. And when I told him I was here to measure compaction with it, he told me that I would just find it, find roots, <laughs> which was actually, which is technically true. <laughs> Um, and it was just incredible how deep his soil profile goes. Um, and that's a compaction reading of 150 centimeters, uh, 150 PSI at 40 centimeters. Uh, so com in comparative with all the other landscapes, it's incredibly high. And we can see that he's fostering aerobic conditions. So that's why there's no disease causing organisms present because those aerobic conditions run all the way through his soil. Um, next slide. Here we have the data at 40 centimeters depth. Um, the reason why we went to 40 centimeters was that was as far as I could dig down in the native forest. Um, so we set that as the parameter to measure all other data against. Here you can see that the fungal to biomass ratio again is highest at Ernest Farm and would indicate that it runs all the way through the soil, promoting aerobic conditions and facilitating that soil sponge. So we get all of those ecosystem benefits again. Yeah, again, this is a this is a case study to see how Ernest is building topsoil over time. And that fertility runs all the way through his soil. So when you when I was digging down, you can see roots at every single layer compared to the conventional cacao farm where there's no root present <laughs> or the native forest. And it's just incredible to see that that change and also the color. I wish I had photos of the color changes of those different soils as you move through that profile because it's just black. 
like when we talk about Tierra Preta, like it is, that is it at Ernest Baum. Um, so yeah, when we compare these results to the other landscape, there really is no comparison. So we can say that, oh, sorry, the next slide, I have the results on that, yeah. Um, so the results were that the high fungal biomass present at Ernest Farm is, is, is higher than that compared with the other locations. A fungal to bacterial ratio meets the successional stage of his desired crop compared with the conventional farmer's soil. Um, the succession of Ernest land is further in succession than that of an unmanaged landscape. So there's a positive impact that Ernest is having on that ecosystem. His farm has the lowest levels of compaction compared to all other areas. Uh, the microbial community is present at all layers of the soil, up to 40 centimeters cubed tested, facilitating the soil sponge. Um, no potential disease causing organisms were observed um, compared with that of the conventional or the native forest. And the conventional agriculture has the highest compaction readings and the highest bacterial counts, as well as the potential causing organisms. And we can also say that through Ernest management, he is fostering uh, ecological succession through his interaction as a positive input. Um, the next next slide. Uh, th these were some pictures that I took at Ernest Farm uh, that I thought were, <laughs> were quite um, interesting, especially when we think about the soil food web techniques. Uh, the dynamics of natural species succession. I, I arrived at the farm while he was replanting this part of the cacao, cacao farm. And starting the, the 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 planting with species and species succession of using annuals. Uh, this is an, an idea that like for us, as we go to school, we go through a nursery, we go through a primary school, a secondary school, a college, university, and then we enter into life. And it's the same that plants need as they grow. Like we can't just put a cacao out there and expect it to grow. And when we use the dynamics of species succession, each species is facilitating the micro the microbial community for the next plant to thrive. And while we're also doing this, this is a this is planted with tomatoes, and there's pineapples inside of this system as well. There's a, a there's an array of plants that I can't do justice with describing here. <laughs> We'd need a different webinar for that. But basically, as he's moving through the system, he's harvesting as well. So there's there's two benefits that are happening. One, he's increasing the the potential of the the land to grow cacao to foster an ecosystem, but also harvesting at the same time. And that's that's a really beautiful interaction that we as humans can have on our ecosystem through that interaction. Um, the next slide, please. Um, this is to maximize photosynthesis at all space and time. Uh, on the left, we can see an early consortium of plants. And as it moves through, uh, it gathers, it builds in its complexity. But the most important thing is we have photosynthesis operating at each each stage. That photosynthesis is providing a lot of ex exudates for our mi microorganisms to grow. Um, this was corn growing in the middle of the jungle, dark green, no pest and disease issues, highly productive. Um, and this is kind of that, that idea of what we used to do when, like, when the world was all intact, we went to those, those forests, we cut them down because of the fertility of their soil. And this is exactly what Ernest is, rep is, is um, replicating here. But in all of these spaces in time, as it evolves through the system, it's taking that sun energy and investing it into the, the root zone, providing exudates in the amino acids from the sunlight. And all of this diversity of plants, their roots are, are cooperating in a way and they're not, co they're not competing together. So we have that maximum diversity happening um, at, at, at all stages of this, of this plantation or the, at this farm. And, um, and the cooling effect as well that that has when we have a sea of green of leaves that are absorbing all of that sun's radiation and turning it into uh, into amino acids, it's uh, it's also cooling. It has a cooling effect. Uh, it's cooling the micro the micro region and the macro region of the world. Um, so the next slide. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, this is the pruning that Ernest was talking about. I took these pictures while he was uh, pruning um, in the rainy season. Um, and this is the extremity that, that Ernest prunes to. So when I took an agroforestry course while I was doing permaculture in Costa Rica, and they said never remove more than 30% of a canopy. Um, and this, this, this comes back to our knowledge of Ernest Dow principles of life, of to, to look at the plant and understand what it wants before we interact with it. Um, if, we, if we have that, that knowledge before we start, we can really enhance the system rather than just going forward and making a huge amount of mistakes. Let's learn from each other. Uh, to mimic and foster ecosystem restoration. Um, and so I was really impressed with this pruning strategy uh, when we think about how much how much of a flush that brings into our soil, the plant invests into its root zone and feeds the microorganisms that are below the soil. 
um, when Ernest is pruning the density uh, of all of these trees, he's stratifying the forest, as he was saying about, so he's benefiting from thermodynamics. So as that air that comes through a farm, which is an aridifying process, it dries out the landscape. Instead, as he combines it with his, his stratification of the forest, he can cool, he, that hot air moves and rises and condenses as it falls, and the hot and the cold water condenses back into water. So turning that tool that we would, that we would often assume as a drying out process becomes one of our greatest tools to facilitate growth through the diversity in the planting and the stratifying of pruning of the trees. We're also looking at all of these endophytes, you know, that are in this canopy of these trees being cycled back down into the soil through the, through the mulch layer that's developed over here. So the constant cycle of those endophytes being taken up into the, into the leaves, and then that canopy being reduced back down into the soil, feeding that diversity of organisms to then be taken back up into the trees canopy. Um, so the next, next slide, please. Um, all of this pruning, diversity, and photosynthesis uh, brings organic matter, and it really does matter. Um, on the left side, we can see the or the conventional cacao farm, uh, the soil pro the soil texture after you scrape away the little amount of organic matter that's there. There's a little bit of moss growing. You can see anaerobic conditions. The soil color is orange, compared with the Ernest Agroecological Farm on the side here, which is a dense layer of organic matter, Ernest on average produces 20,000 kilograms of dry organic matter per hectare annually. That is a huge amount. That's fivefold more than the most vigorous uh, ecosystem in his area. And all of that organic matter leads to this beautiful formation of soil. And we can just see in here all of the roots are in that soil. It's that chocolate, that 70% chocolate color that Elaine talks about. Uh, it's full of humics. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's an amazing, amazing tool. And all of this carbon that he brings back down into the system builds habitat for those microorganisms. Um, it cycles it back into the most stable form, all of that carbon back into topsoil or back into the microbial uh, necromass of the soil. Um, and then when we, we have that, you know, one gram of carbon holds eight grams of water. So if we have all of this carbon coming back into our soil, um, uh, there's a famous saying from Ernest that he plants water and um, and this is really the, a key driving force behind all of that, and why 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 it actually why he does fully plant, plant water. Um, all right, so the next slide, if that's possible. Um, so yeah, create the conditions for life, and uh, and life will thrive. This is these on the on the left side, scraping back leaf uh, organic matter to uh, to take samples from, and at every corner there was just a web of hyphae. Uh, the middle picture is a macro aggregate around a bit of wood, but that's all soil and it's held together again by fungal hyphae. And then the right side is what it looks like on the forest floor when Ernest prunes. And it almost looks like the start of a biocomplete compost pile. Um, in fact, it's just like one huge composting facility in this, in this forest that Ernest manages. So really creating all of these conditions that Ernest has talked about fosters life to thrive and life attracts more life. And when we understand those principles, then we can design our farming system to, to facilitate that growth. Um, so next slide, these are just some pictures that I thought I would put in here of, um, of the fungi that I saw while I was doing some soil analysis. Uh, they were beautiful. There were a lot of basidiomyces found uh, at Ernest Farm. Um, and yeah, if you like the photos or I have a, a bunch more photos, please contact me and I can I can share them with you from the from the assessment. I just wanted to include these because I know that we all love uh, pictures of fungi. Um, so the, the, the next slide, if possible. Uh, OK, alternatively, um, we go back to our high input agriculture to meet the needs of the present. 40% uh, of all the profits go towards the purchasing of fertilizer and pesticides, 300 kilos of uh, solid MPK per hectare are used. Uh, this kills the biology, increases compaction, it leads to the disease and pest issues that we see, and environmental degradation. So these, this is a picture of the canopy while I was there at the cacao farm, and you can see that it's barely got any new leaves forming. In fact, they're, they're all dying. Um, there's substantial witch broom disease and pest um, and fungal issues that are attacking these trees. Um, and so we can see that it's not really fostering the, the conditions that Ernest talks about that we need to foster in, in order for life to thrive and grow. Um, and we won't have these have these problems in our farm at all if it's possible carla to go back to the um to go back a few slides to just see what back again back again to the pruning one 
Is that one more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if we held that picture that we saw of the cacao farm, this is Ernest cacao farm at the same period of time. And you can see the amount of new growth that is coming onto these cacao trees. Each one has, is its canopy is full. There's new leaves forming on these cacaos. Whereas when we looked at the conventional cacao farmer, the, the top of the tree is, is starting to, all the leaves are turning brown and there's disease and pest issues compared with Ernest farm. Okay. Um, yeah, we can go back to that, to that slide. Very good. Another one, another one, another one. Yeah, the, um, yeah, there we go. So um, all in all, we can say that the fungi is a key to our ecological succession. It's the key driving force behind Ernest Farm and it functions because of his management. Um, it does turn out that our, our biggest input does need to be knowledge so that we can foster environments that work just as Ernest has, has showed us and demonstrated based on this evidence that we've collected using the soil food web model. Um, he has achieved a biomass, a, bi a fungal biomass comparable with that of the Climax ecosystem in 40 years, which is just absolutely in incredible. He's, he's facilitated that ecological succession faster than a natural ecosystem. So there is a positive influence that humans can have on this planet. And through Ernest's Ernest model, we can, we can start to align ourselves with that natural flow and become, and become part of the Tao and be in that flow of life and that, uh, that energy, which is so important. Um, the, the last slide, possible. Okay, perfect. So in summary, um, with all of this being said, our agriculture and land management strategies must necessitate an, an environment that fosters soil microorganism growth. Only by doing so can we hope to attain agricultural methods that are not only productive and nutritious, but also regenerative. The research findings finally underscore the rationale behind the adoption of Ernest's agroecological model as a productive and regenerative agricultural management strategies. And, um, and it is definitely a blueprint for us to return back to a Garden of Eden, an opportunity to align ourselves with a new paradigm um, with nature. So last, lastly, I feel that um, just uh, on the next slide, that the, the future research that we need to do is to really combine Ernest agroecological model and the soil food web system to see how they can regenerate landscapes and meet the needs of the president. Uh, like if we can all make like bioconfig compost and use consortiums and the input and the knowledge generated by Ernest, um, I think that we can have a huge impact on the world and steer ourselves back on course to be with the DAO. Um, if anyone wants to contact me, I have my email address down there below. And the last slide, oh yeah, let's return back to this, this picture where we don't see a difference between our agriculture and the forest, where we don't see nature as something separate from ourselves, where we live in harmony with it and, um, and our systems can benefit from, from aligning ourselves with the natural flow of life. So thank you very much. Okay, so take a couple seconds to absorb so much knowledge. And while you do that, I will we will quickly watch another video before starting our Q and A session. The benefit of being in the Soil Food Web School is you learn a lot of tips and tricks. It taught me what good compost was and what good biology was. What I've learned, um, one of the big key things for me is that plants don't need to be fed. With the microbes, they are able to feed themselves and supply themselves everything that they need from the soil. This, you know, is something that I had never seen before until I took this school. And understanding where you are in this process in your field really helps you make some management decisions. When we first started this journey, um, our soils were very degraded. You know, I couldn't find a earthworm to save our lives. We were spending way too much money on um, fertilizer. And uh, just the consistency from year to year was just not there for us. I would plant my plants in my soil that I had amended with compost that I purchased. And I'd see really good production in the beginning. And then it would just sort of taper off. I knew you could get bad compost. What I didn't know was how good compost can be when you make it yourself and properly. We've looked at my compost under the microscope and we've looked at my soil that has had all of the previous compost applied to it in the year before. I had no life and then Brian and I looked at my soil after I applied the extracts and the compost that I put in the plants and started everything with. 
to having all of this life. Agropira was a farm that reached out to us, really struggling to work within a conventional system. The yields were quite low, so we were able to see over 100% yield increases in these areas. And the second year we saw again about 100% yield increase on top of that. We never got the productivity that we're getting today. In a month, we are going to get about 20 tons per hectare on grapes in the first year. What happened between 21 and 22 is our organic matter improved a little bit. Uh, our pH dropped a little bit, so we're headed the right direction. Our EC improved, and all of this led to an increase in growth in our plants. The other thing that, that changed was our fungal to bacterial ratio. And I think that's what I'm most excited about. Big picture benefits is lower input costs, which is a big deal. Yields have improved. Um, and we are more so self-sufficient self as a farm. We were probably saving right out the gate, probably anywhere between 100 to $150 per acre. Some of that cost is obviously less tillage, lower on your fuel costs. We've cut out all seed treatment. Majority of our fungicide costs, we cut out between 60 and 100 units of nitrogen. We have no uh, potash or DAP costs, and then we do not use any insecticide. We've cut all those out. The results that I had from implementing Brian's practices was just phenomenal. Bringing Miles and Terraforma and the Soil Food Web on board has been probably one of my happiest and best decisions. For me, it's about trying to leave this soil better than what I found it so my children don't have to go through some of the challenges that I've had to. If you are also ready to make the soil better for future generations, here's something you can do today. From now until February 29th, when you sign up for the Level Up Your Soil package, you'll get access to the Foundation courses, our all-new Soil Food Web Essentials course, the Soil Sponge Workshop with educator and author Dee Dee Pursehouse, and you'll receive a coupon for $150 off the soon-to-launch Permaculture Design course, featuring 70-plus permaculture experts from around the globe, all at a 46% discount off the value of the package. Join today to level up your soils. Financing options are now available so you can pay at your own pace with a firm. If you're not ready to dig into the full foundation courses, we have something to suit every pocket, such as the Soil Food Web Essentials course. This is an accessible, low cost and minimal time commitment course for newbies and those wanting to refresh and expand their soil knowledge. Venture into the transformative world of essential ecology, microbiology, and soil stewardship. Explore the science and vision of soil life with Dr. Elaine Ingham and a global team of soil educators so you can level up your collaboration with living systems on farms, gardens, or landscapes. Take advantage of this great offer to level up your soils today with the Soil Food Web Essentials course for just $1.99. Awesome. So if you have any questions about uh, anything that we talk about so far, we're going to have, uh, sorry, we're going to have the contacts later today. And also you can reach our team uh, at the school at info at soilfoodweb.com for any more support. The benefit of being. I'm sorry. Okay, I can do it. So today we have two offers, sorry, this cycle we have two offers like the video just explained to us. The Soil Food Web Essentials is an amazing price and we are there waiting for you with amazing level of information. And also if it's your time to join the foundation courses and um, many more amazing information, you also have the offer one. Again, if you have questions, do, do not hesitate to contact our amazing staff team. Okay, so let's start with the Q&A and the first question is coming from Mike. I will read the question and I will ask our panelists to just answer as you want and chime in as you see fit. So uh, from Mike, are you saying you cut down the top of the trees to put the tree tops on the ground to create a ground cover. I am confused why cutting the top story of the cocoa trees helped the corn crops so much. 
Thank you for clarifying. Who wants to start? Philip? Um, <clears throat> maybe Joaquim, maybe Joaquim, you want to take this one? Well, this, this refers to the uh, accompanying trees. Uh, yeah, peak pruning. Uh, uh, we are we are planting high density of trees, uh, mother trees, uh, uh, one tree for each cuckoo tree or, or, or even more. So um, regarding planting annual crops like corn, like maize uh, or, or other crops in an uh, already established cocoa plantation, this is only possible where you are creating gaps. So uh, in a younger plantation, after pruning, after this heavy pruning, uh, of the accompanying trees of the mother trees uh, and also of pruning cocoa uh, it's still possible during the first years to grow even annual crops in between in all the plantation this is only possible where you have some some bigger gaps sufficient sufficiently uh, um, uh, sufficient uh, big surfaces to avoid the 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 bordering uh, influence uh, the influence of of the bordering um, cocoa and and trees. So this refers to growing maize in cocoa. And yeah. then that um, that plant material coming down onto the surface of the soil, it's right in place to um, make a you know a, a good compost right around the um, stem of that plant as well. So you're using what the plant's pro um, producing, open up that um, sunlight to the lower part of the of the of the um, ground, and then you lay that plant material that's now going to decompose and return some of those nutrients back into the soil. So one of well, what is what is what is even possible, or what we are doing when we are establishing a a, cook, a, a plantation in in a fellow, even an older fellow. Uh, cleaning, uh, doing a cleaning, um, um, a first cleaning, then we're broadcasting seeds, then we cut everything, uh, we chop the branches, we cover with a 15, 20, 30 centimeters uh, layer of organic matter, and with beans, uh, a cassava, a maize, uh, the seeds are achieving to going through this uh, layer, and uh, the uh, the first time you have to do some management practices when harvesting, so no weeding is necessary. Uh, and this is similar what you can do in the first years uh, when you have a, um, in, in cocoa or in other uh, permanent uh, crop plantations. I would um, I would just add on to this question as well about the ground cover. Um, the cacao is operating as the ground cover in this forest dynamics. So we have these low strata, uh, the low strata tree, our ground cover is the cacao. And it's planted at such a high density that that operates as in this forest ecosystem as the ground cover as well. And just the amount of diversity brings that organic matter back. And that's one of Ernest's principles is to generate that organic matter on site where you are instead of importing. Once we're importing material, it's not a self-sufficient system. Yep, exactly. You wanna uh, have everything stay more or less in place so you don't have to be dragging it all over the place, breaking your back, you know, um, trucks and gasoline and diesel and stuff. is just a waste of your time when you can work with nature instead of against her. Yeah, I'd love to, um, let me see if I can summarize this because it's from a lot of different conversations and YouTube channel presentations that are up. We have to bring carbon into our systems because that's what the life in the soil consumes. The plants fix carbon and we have exudates if there's living plant roots, but often we also find that getting dead plant material onto the surface, protects the surface, adds extra you know, potential to that system. You will find lots of people out there right in the regenerative ag movement that focus only on like chop and drop, get a bunch of carbon in there, and they don't really pay attention to the soil life. And we have found here, Dr. Elaine has found in her career, that 
the biological community and the soil kind of matters too. <laughs> and that the of. best synergy, <laughs> the best synergy happens when you have both things. So look for all of those opportunities, any opportunity you can find on your land to take excess carbon materials and get them onto the soil surface and get them into that system because they're bringing in nutrients and they're feeding the microorganisms. But if you are ignoring the biological community below ground, then you are tying a hand behind your back as somebody who's trying to work with these landscapes. It's the beauty happens when we bring the plants and the microorganisms together into a beautiful partnership. And that's a mistake so many agronomists have made is, you know, like me, when I was in grad school looking for my, what topic did I want to uh, look at for my PhD? And it was to try to figure out what fungi were doing in the soil. Well, you know, what are all these critters in that soil meant to do? And my manager professor told me to go out and talk to all of the soils people and all the soils department, the, you know, the directors, the heads of the department and ask if um, a, a PhD could uh, um, work on what do fungi actually do in soil uh, for their PhD and being told by each and every one of those 12 to 14 people, they told me, no, you're not going to be able to get a job after you get done with a graduate school because we all know that bacteria and fungi, these things in the soil, the life in the soil, don't do anything. They don't help your plant. Me, the words, you know, the, the mainly they think of um, these organ thought of these organisms in the soil as being just uh, uh, diseases. I mean, who, who causes causes diseases in the soil? It's bacteria and it's fungi. And then along come all of the uh, insects and um, you know, other things that eat the bacteria and fungi that eat the uh, food web. And uh, finally figuring it out and the general public is starting to see the results of people's really hard work. So um, we've got to get out and and move quickly on this uh, process of getting the good news to everybody. They can easily grow a garden in their backyard. They can easily grow things for the community in the, um, you know, the parks that we have. And, um, and there's, it's still beautiful looking. Uh, we don't have to have bare soil to grow anything. We've got to actually have uh, composted and then make sure we build that understory set of plants that won't let weeds in and will um, speak and talk in, in microbe language to those plants that you've planted so that everything grows to its maximum potential. So thank you, Elaine and Ernest, for leading the way. And uh, let's move for the next question. First, thank you everyone for amazing questions. We are struggling here to choose between the many of them. So we do our best to cover as much questions as we can. The next one is from Grace. What do you think are the biggest barriers to scaling up agroecological methods to replace chemical dependent agriculture? Structural, political, or monetary, or a combination? Thank you, Grace. Who wants to take the lead? Chemical, <laughs> chemical companies, those are the biggest problem. Not only, uh, I political. think uh, uh, science, uh, uh, then uh, international, international programs, um, how do you say, uh, um, all this, all this, um, uh, international development uh, aid programs. Uh, it's also our way how to how to how to uh, the the modern paradigm of science. Uh, even uh, we are working with with uh, organic uh, people from Switzerland. They are as conventional in their thinking as other scientists. So I think this is. Uh, there's uh, a lot of barriers uh, uh, regarding upscaling, but 
uh, it's amazing when you work with, we are working mostly with small farmers, small scale farmers in, in Africa and Latin America and Asia. So when you start uh, um, stopping fighting against nature, when you, uh, even in the beginning, you don't, don't have organic matter to cover the soil, you, we carried it from, from wherever. Uh, in a couple of square meters to show the difference when you have a piece of, of soil covered with whatever organic matter compared with uh, 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 beside uh, the same piece of land with the same seeds without any organic uh, cover. Only this difference is so, 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 so impact, impacting that the people understand that we have to produce organic matter there on the ground. We have to produce the fertilizer on the field, and it's not it's not possible to bring uh, 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 organic matter from outside. So we have to produce everything in the field, and this is it, this is not it. It sounds complex and difficult, but uh, there, are, yeah, uh, in practice we found a lot of uh, ways how to how to achieve this. Yep. Um. I think, yeah, a lot of it has to do like cultural context as well, which we work in. I'm reading about 40 years, no, 40 centuries of farming. Um, and it talks about how China, Japan and Korea um, designed the, their agricultural systems to, you know, there's a, a way in permaculture to look at cycling of the system. You know, how do we close that loop? And um, and it's a collective effort of a cultural imp imp like imperative to put that attention on those avenues of our pollution and turning those avenues and actually directing our energy to shift those because we're like like we have it like all we have is time so what do we do but... with this time and yeah and so where does our yeah <laughs> where what did they forget. All of these um, groups of people that put together things, even permaculture, I remember having very heated arguments with Bill Morrison about um, the need to understand what's going on with microorganisms in your soil. You can't achieve good continuous year after year after year if you don't pay attention to the microorganisms in the soil. It takes a inexpensive little microscope to be able to see those organisms. But it's critical to understand that, well, with that um, cold snap we had for the last two weeks where the soil was frozen because, you know, for various reasons, uh, we, have no, we have very few microorganisms left. You're going to have to rebuild. So how do you know that that it, uh, your microorganisms yeah. made it through just fine this year? Not last year, but this year. So you no problem with decomposition. So we got to get people to add in the microbial part of all of this. Every surface should be covered with the proper sets of microorganisms, both above ground as well as below. Yeah. Yeah, I would add on this realm also the power of education and social pressure that uh, we have to talk more about those things. Like I see many people comment in the chat. I believe this is also how we can uh, one person at a time, one client at a time to reinforce the importance and that is really possible to change. And in, it's in our hands to push these changes to come faster. So it's one of those discussions that there is no end. So anyone has any more comment or we can move for the next question. Just real quick, somebody asked about microscope recommendations. Please go to our website um, and take a look. Um, give a call to, um, what is it, info at soilfoodweb.com because there's lots of things you have to know about your eyes and um, what magnifications and things. So just a little bit of effort so you get the, the, the right microscope the first time. It's, it's going to be on the order of $300 to maybe $400. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elaine. So next question. Can you guys see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, next next question. Uh, does Syntropic only work for tropical trees alleyways? 
no dry land, rainy season, row crops? Not at all. So we work with these kinds of systems for um, every plant that's grown on the planet. Um, and the, how do you select against weeds? Uh, if you go through the foundation courses, you start to understand that and be able to choose which stage of succession your soil is in. It's uh, You're never going to um, be able to grow wetland plants in the Sahara Desert. Not going to happen until we change the... Um, weather conditions, the climatic conditions, and the way you would change those climatic conditions would be to get the microorganisms and the and the, uh, plant material, the, the carbon, back into that soil. And we could recover the, the uh, Sahara Desert and, the, well, all of them. Anyone else? Yeah, no, I think that um, the syntropic, like this idea of just tropic, just because it has tropical in that word, has nothing to do with the principles behind syntropic agriculture. It's a, a centropic energy that moves through the system. And that's the life flow, though, if we can tap into that, we have entropy and centropy. And so if we design our systems in, with the centropic energy, they will continue to flourish as they grow. And that's through the liquid carbon pathway of plants and microbes functioning together to develop more and more complex systems. Finally, the complexification of solar energy in, in organic compounds, it's not only a chemi chemical uh, question, but also information uh, related to information transferred by, by solar energy uh, converted into organic uh, uh, compounds. So um, there are nice, more and more interesting um, examples of uh, syntropic farming in in Central Europe and the South of Europe, what is missing is the the uh, um, we have or we 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 have still a lack of machinery adapted to to the management of syntropic farming. So, but there are also companies uh, uh, most in in Brazil they are already um, practicing. Um, in, in not only in the tropics, uh, practicing syntropic farming uh, on a big, big scale. Uh, and uh, they're going to adapt machinery to this kind of, 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 of farming. You know, I think this question gets to the heart of one of the more challenging things, especially for people that are taking early steps into this space and thinking. There are universal principles that can be applied everywhere. And there are lots of specifics. And it can be very confusing if you get on a webinar and hear someone talk about, you know, a particular plant species and think, oh, that's the answer. They said that plant species is perfect. And then it's not for your region a good choice. So you have to reach both for the universal principles of centropic agroforestry regenerative agriculture, soil food web, soil biological management. And then you also have to reach for local solutions, local understanding how the specific combinations of species meet together in your context. And in fact, context has become the number one principle of regenerative agriculture. Context matters. So I'm going to post in the chat my favorite link to post in the chat in these discussions with people all over the world, pay attention to your bioregion and be very, very cautious if someone is telling you, you know, what you really need to do is go out there and put, I don't know, quinoa or something in your farm. Quinoa came from somewhere. It works really well there. It doesn't work well everywhere. So we have to pay attention to those local factors. This is perhaps one of the barriers uh, uh, you mentioned um that uh, there are no recipes uh, in how to do syntropic farming. Uh, you have to understand the principles and you have to uh, adjust and adapt the principles according to uh, each specific site. And uh, once understanding 
the basics of these principles, I think we never will be able to understand the complexity of life. Uh, but understanding at least basics of the principles of life, yeah. then it's it's it it turns it turns uh, really uh, easy. Uh, uh, well, we are always learning uh, by 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 try and error. But uh, um, after a couple of, of of years or decades of of experiences, you see that it's it's really not so not so difficult as, as it uh, seems to be. And we have a lot of of young young people, young farmers who are un, who, who understand the, the principles in much shorter uh, time than I needed, for example, to understand it. So there's also a, a, a succession of process in 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 understanding. Beautiful. So I think we have time to squeeze one more question. So this question is from Tabata. I want to use this knowledge on the forest care level. Fires help, but we need periods of soil building by leaving debris to feed the environment. How do we develop a program on a national, national level for forest health management alongside ecosystem balance? Great question, Tabata. Thank you. I don't agree at all that fires help. <laughs> Fire has nothing to do in 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 this in in in, in this respect. Sorry. So I think well, uh, oh, I yeah. might add that yeah. fire fi the the ecosystem has to have evolved with fire. For fire fire can be a very important tool here in North America for the management of ecosystems. Wow. And there's a long tradition of indigenous communities using fire, but it's not for everywhere. <laughs> it's only for those places adapted to that um, fire. And usually it has to be in the wet time of the year or you're going to take too much out of your soil and blow it off. Yeah, I think I think it's quite an interesting conversation. I know Ernest talks about fire and, and where it's come from and um, you know, it's all about the domestication of humans interaction on landscape and um, and throughout whether that's through indigenous culture and history and management of grasslands and productivity of crops. Um, there is this conversation of are they actually natural um, and do they need to be there in terms of the ecosystem development? I think what we're mainly missing in our forestry management systems are the keystone species and disturbances through them. We find now that we're coming to like secondary forests that can't evolve further because they're locked in a successional stage or early pioneer species where they're just trapped and there's no succession, there's no movement, no one's coming through there. And when I first took a centropic course with Fernando, he the first tool he had was a chainsaw, you know, and it's this this is a totally different idea compared to permaculture and hey, just like leave it alone, touch a little bit around. But where do where does the where do the where do we as a species function in that development of fostering ecosystem generation? And it comes back to asking what that what these plants need, just and how that food web actually interacted before it was disturbed, because we're missing all like a lot of herbivores that were managing these ecosystems when the world was in in intact and the forest were operating on those uh, on that successional stage. So I think it's really complex that I see you answer that that question. Yeah, I think that also demands uh, to tag a little bit more to talk about this question about the national plan. This mm. is, uh, like everyone said, is a long discussion, but needs to be with an interdisciplinary team. You cannot rely on just one perspective. You need to have all the stakeholders involved because a lot of times uh, the national plans end up being more political than ecological per se. So we need to make sure that this group uh, focusing on these discussions cannot lose the main goal for the plan. So majority of times, of course, will be to make money. No one, uh, I mean, we cannot be that naive, but uh, there is ways to find the best balance to attend all the stakeholders' needs. So we are on the top of the hour and uh, I appreciate everyone here. And just to 
summarize this round of uh, this series of webinars. Uh, next webinar, we will talk about why soil matters and how to further your education in soil regeneration. Dr. Elaine, Dr. Adam, and myself, we will talk a bit more about the role of soil life in our biosphere. So do not forget to click on the reminder in our YouTube channel or pay attention, sorry, on your email with the link for the next two webinars. I am honored about to be the host of today in uh, name of the school, all the staff uh, and all the attendees. I really wanna say thank you to Philip, to Ernest and Joaquin to take this time to teach us so much about the agroecology. Here you can find their links. Uh, I suggest you to take a quick print screen so you're gonna have all their information, but in case you miss, uh, this webinar will be uploaded in our YouTube channel in the next 24, 48 hours. And you can also reach us via info at soilfoodweb.com to request their contacts as well. Philip, Joaquin, uh, any last minute message for today? Well, thank only you. thank you very much for, for, the, for the invitation. I think it's wonderful to... To, to 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 have the possibility to, to participate in this event and yeah hopefully we we, we keep you in touch and are looking forward to working together because finally uh, the only way to move something on our planet is to work together like the the, the, the fungi are doing and the, and all the microbes so let us uh, do a uh, work in the underground uh, but be very efficient. Indeed. As I say, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this data from Ernest Farm and Elaine for teaching and giving me the skills for for what I've been able to, to, to collect. So thank you. Thank you for that. Could I borrow some of your slides so I can, I've got about, oh, I don't know, 10 um, talks coming up and it would be great to take the data that was shown here the pictures that go along with okay. it but you too Ernst um, it'd be great to include that in my slide and, and send people to your websites get them understanding this massive diversity of climates and um, plants interacting with each other um, can't do it without you privilege thank you That's true. So I want also to acknowledge the beautiful staff we have supporting us on these webinars, just to cite some names. We have Sammy, we have Denise, we have Ignacio, we have Alex, and all the Soil Food Web School staff supporting us. And uh, thank you so much for another beautiful webinar and see you guys soon. Stay safe and keep it doing good compost everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Ciao. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos.